So this is an addendum update of our inking exercise. You should be doing your inking exercises in your Jean-Claude Potez sketchbook and or something similar. You want a smooth quality paper. If you don't have a sketchbook for this, the cartridge paper you would use in your printer, your regular photocopy printer, you know, everyday cartridge paper, is perfectly acceptable. It's actually much the same in terms of uh, the smoothness. Get yourself a blank page, and we're going to organize the space. This is an opportunity to learn a couple of uh, ruler-free tricks. So for the, these three sides, it's the basic one. Tip, be sure to be aware of how hard you're going to press here when you do the move I'm about to show you. You don't want to press too hard and give yourself a paper cut and don't go uh, 45 degree over the edge like this and then move really fast. You'll give yourself a paper cut. Make sure you're flat on the side, on a smoothish side. You place your pencil where you want it in terms of the depth of the line. With a nice new pencil like this, I can reach all the way in here. And a little bit of reach and get past the halfway point, which means I can do any part of the page. So this is a handy trick for ruler-like lines without a ruler. Just bring your hand down, gently guiding with the side of the pencil. So. For this top line, because of the bumps, the easier thing to do is to exploit the elbow. So find a comfortable place to put your elbow that leaves your hand where we want it to be in the drawing surface. You want it to be on something secure, not floating in the air, and preferably not on a part of your body that isn't anchored. So it could be on your knee as long as your foot is on the floor. So I write the paper so that the line, the straight line I'm trying to render, is at right angles to where I've positioned my elbow. In other words, if I point my hand straight up to the middle of where that line is going to be, after I draw the line, I'll be able to make a T by doing this. We find a comfortable place, and because we're going to go in more through the the course of drawing this line, we want to make sure that we're not already cramped up when we start it. So make sure that you're holding your tool freely. And ghost out the line a couple times. Measure and then draw. Don't think too much. And you know, there's a way, here's a trick. You can optically check the straightness of your line. Take one of the other and angle the paper so that it's at your eye. So I'm going to do it for the camera. And look down the line. And variations in the line will become very quickly apparent to your eye. It's a trick I use a lot when I want to see if I've rendered a straightish line. Get yourself eight cells. And try to finish a batch of eight cells in one sitting. You want to have at least that level of intensity of involvement for a good solid practice and getting familiar and comfortable with the tools over the course of your practice. And in those cells, I'm going to have you draw more patterns. So I've done a few new ones that we haven't tried already and uh, built on the ones we had before. And I can also introduce some forms that we want you to start getting familiar with. This one is a lot of fun to do. I'm going to talk about it first. It's kind of a loose, uh, randomized basket weave pattern. I use it a lot. There's probably a proper name for it, but it's almost unimportant. The doing of it, the seeing, what you're seeing here, is what's most important. And when you keep doing that, till you fill up the cell. And part of the exercise here is trying to keep your strokes consistent and paying attention in this case to the randomness of the pattern trying to make sure that like I don't now put in a bunch of lines like that right there because that would mesh with this in a way that I'd rather they didn't so I'm going to do this instead I'm going to do those and stop there and now do this so I'm going to keep the uh, angle where they meet changing and never lining up. Still squares with that. Now, you're familiar with the this pattern we did right away. Uh, play with experimenting, holding your tool more in the upright calligraphy position. 
Remember it's laying on your fingertips and between your fingertips and your thumb as opposed to being uh, gripped, held tight. You want a bit more freedom of movement. And when you're doing these back and forth patterns, this is a, a good way to go because you can do things like looping back up and, and in directions that would be going against the hairs of your brush. You can maintain the continuous strokes and uh, just getting better at this sort of free looping pattern. Some more loops could be useful for like say, I don't know, barbed wire friends someday, something like that. Small circles, practice making those. Your swiggly snake lines, uh, also very useful in general when you're drawing. Feathering and cross hatching. And I'm also using the curve gesture of moving from the wrist. And actually not, I'm not doing that, but I'm keeping my hand fairly locked up and still and just using the wrist motion to get this arcing pattern. And I'm moving the paper slightly as I work. So I don't want to be pressing too hard to stick on the paper. I don't want to rush it so that I start getting sloppy and all over. You can do that and have more organic pattern. If you want more control, you have to be careful about how much pressure you're doing. So let's demonstrate a couple of those. Remember to get comfortable with the gesture before you start striking the paper. And when you've locked in the position of your hand, and your wrist, and you're using the wrist curve, it's actually fairly easy to line up and continue a line you might break by accident like that. Just remember not to go and lose position too fast so you can't come back and do that. It's the definite advantage of becoming more systematic and, uh, and mechanical, is the way I always thought of it as a kid, about your drawing technique. This is basically stippling, but we're doing it with a brush. Stippling, uh, you know, with a pen, you make lots of little dots, you make some of them bigger and they're closer together. It's like organic halftone. It's a pretty powerful rendering technique, but very time consuming. This is similarly time consuming, but it can be quite interesting and nuanced and subtle. You're exploiting that shape as opposed to a dot, and there's, an there's a directionality to it that seems to be pointing. And when you do lots of little ones and you change the directions, you end up with a, a texture that is pretty powerful and useful. It can be all kinds of things. Uh, fur on the floor, all sorts of things. Now, thinking from texture, we're going to now combine this with a structured environment that I want you to render using something really organic. This is basically doing a close-up detail of drapery to get you familiar with thinking about how drapery is constructed without worrying about a larger form. So it's just a crop tight shot of the texture, the surface of debris. I'm not even going to ask you to think too much about the direction of the light. I want you mostly to think about how you use feathering to suggest depth and form. So you're going to sketch in one of your cells just some quick arcing lines. And then I, in mine, I also did a couple loops. I decided this is going to be a foreground line, so I ended that one, and I'm not going to use this. And let's see that. Now that's me thinking about, you know, a surface in my head that I can see. This is where the cloth goes away. This is going to be a hard edge of a, a fold. This is a boundary of a, a shadow, and a place where there's another going to be another shadow, and shadow here. Then, I want to render a couple of these lines to create edges. So again, we're using, exploiting the elbow. I'm going to start dark and go light. In other words, depth, and then retreat from the paper to create a feathered line as it comes out to there. It's actually easier to start with a hard edge than it is to end with one, so I'm going to actually start it. So this time it's light to dark. I'm going to pick my line. measure and strike once. This is going to be a, a retreat, a retreat and back into the space. So let's start light, dark, light. Little light, little one, slightly bigger. Uh, 
Uh, as you get more control, I could probably done better than I did this one. This is a little heavy-handed. You can really suggest the character of that space, and you can go back and enhance. That goes even further back right there. That's the lowest point. It's most retreated away from us because it's the farthest from the light source. Uh, pay attention to your sources of light when you show them, particularly on the page. Uh, make sure your shadows fall in the right place. But when you're just working in a space that's going to have more ambient light, think about the most well-lit things being in the foreground and the least well-lit things being in the background, and you have an immediate shorthand for depth. Give yourself instructions. Now, it's sort of like penciling when you're doing comics, but that was really more of a guide for this first stroke that you then want to repeat. So again, think like you're, think about yourself as a machine. Think about the pattern you make and then repeating that pattern very systematically as possible. The more consistent and systematic your strokes and feathering are, the more a smooth surface they will suggest. Variations and texture will translate to variations in texture in the surface. Now, next I'm going to show you is something that I often get compliments on a lot. People like my bricks. And I use one of two techniques predominantly for both for all the bricks I draw. And what I'm basically doing is doing a short stroke with a fixed depth. Um, the first brick I often you know, I'm usually penciling all these out first, but I'm going to just do it in ink with you guys. I'll often just establish the size so I have a gauge and something to measure by. And then I think about what row of them here. Go down, stroke, lift, stroke, lift, stroke, lift. Think about your body again as almost like a machine. You want to end them now alternating. Go to the middle stop, middle stop, middle stop, middle stop. It'll stop. Slight variations are fine. If you look at real masonry, there's often little pieces like that, fillers. Um, but try to do it so that on this next row, you're aligning, you're lining up with the one two up. So look at the middle still, but also look for these mortar lines to match. And then same for the next one down absolutely no harm in and I encourage you to pencil in advance so if you want when you pick a square to do your bricks in you don't have to do a whole square bricks pick like a third of it and draw yourself some roughly even parallel lines to be guides for these strokes and then use them as your guide notice if I go a little fast and I get some breakup that's a useful technique because when you look at it you stack them up it kind of looks like the light catching irregularities in the surface of a clay brick. So, something to think about. You get this from going faster. When you go slower, you get more consistent ink flow. Now, basically the same pattern, but done with little dashes, is quite useful. If it's really even, or as a bit more of an erratic ticking, here I've done a, shown a little square that's on a bit of an angle and you're using little ticks in the surface in roughly this sort of irregular pattern to help suggest light catching surface irregularities and it gives you a sense of directionality and angle and enhances selling the idea that this two-dimensional drawing is actually a three-dimensional object lying on something. Um, this is a close cousin to that thing I quickly showed you in class. It's sort of a trick I used to draw like kaiju monsters with scaly skin and I would draw the skin with these sort of brush strokes. So I'm coming down and getting a nice teardrop shape, and it's almost a scale shape. And if you get the, the pattern right, it should be something like that. It looks totally like dragon skin. You can use it for other things too, but that was something I remember showing you guys briefly in class. I filled up a, a quarter of one of my things with that and some of the tick marks. Give that a try. And our good old friend, the curly Q, uh, I drew on it actually. I'll show you a flower. 
for some more. These are short, consistent feathering lines on the brush tip. We're not using very much of the brush, just the tip. You want to just skirt across and find yourself a good rhythm and do a batch of like 10 or 20 strokes until it gets uncomfortable and then readjust and do some more. It's a good one to practice just your control and the grace of your little feathered lines. And then an application. It's uh, you know, a grass field from above. It's very lovely. Nice texture. This is your classic basket weave. Lines rendered. In this case, fairly strong, hard lines, but you could do feathered ones. But, you know, every fixed and consistent number, you completely reverse the orientation at right angles to each other. And the next row alternates. Now if you just switch the rules so that instead of they're at right angles, if you imagine this little square, they're you know the same as the walls, do diagonals. They're more challenging to keep consistent. So this is one of those ones where it, you know no harm in roughing out your cells in advance. Draw the grid in pencil. For the practice pages, don't worry about it being perfect. It is not required for the exercise. And you're going diagonal across the squares. And you alternate the direction at every other square. Well, at every square, I should say. At each square, you switch the direction. Now, it gets interesting when you start stacking these up because it builds up some really neat optical effects. Well, all this texture work is manufacturing optical illusions for the observer's eye. Much the way half tone does. For work on feathering to suggest gradation. You do really smooth feathering. The smoother your feathering again, the smoother your surface. And you keep them really even if you want a really smooth surface. If you want a, a more organic, irregular surface, then think about moving the lines to suggest, say, this barrel has a dent in it. I'm making them thick and I'm slightly distorting upward. You could, of course, make much more radical shapes, but for just a dent in a barrel, and go back to thin and even. That should be pretty effective on camera, I think. So, this pattern is just a repeating alternating scallop. A little short C shape, invert the C shape, offset, back and forth, dancing with each other, two rows. Part of this exercise is good little practice for your hand. It's kind of like jumping through tires. Things, you can draw a chain using it. So you start like this, and then start like this, and you 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 do as long as rows you need, and then you close the links, and hint at the other side, and you have a big old chain. So it's a good cartoon chain. Um, you can stack your scallops. I'm doing more like this. And a rose. It's another good texture. Lots of small round circles, kind of like we had on the other page here, but close together, like little beads. And sometimes I'm varying the thickness and density, filling them right in in places. This could be lizard scan. It could be pebbles on a road, a path. Um, it's a good texture, very powerful surface. This is the other way I draw bricks, so fairly straightforward. The other one here, I'm drawing the brick and leaving the mortar, mortar to suggestion. The mortar is only hinted at. This, I'm drawing the mortar and the brick is hinted at. Controlled depth lines, you've you don't go up and down, you know, no feathering going on here. Using the swing of the wrist and try to make sure there are no interruptions between in your movement. 
created by the surface you're on. Put all your weight on your elbow, keep your hand free. Do steady lines. Fixed widths. You want to keep your width as even as you can to sell a good brick wall. And of course, you can pencil these out. You don't have to go straight to ink like I am. But uh, it's good practice to try. Use the same width of line, roughly, to break them up into cells. And then the next row, just alter, come down from the middle of the previous. And when you get into the continuing, look to be lining up with the rows two above. The thing I want to start getting you guys to do is building yourself up geometric forms, uh, patterns of light and dark first. So, you know, totally valid one is your classic checker box. If you want to start there, that's okay. But I want you to take on some more challenging ones too. So the checker box, you're trying to create very even lines and then fill alternating boxes. But it's kind of too easy. I did this one. Instead of drawing these lines, I would just do a triangle. And then I would try to orient along the base of that triangle to the next row and draw another triangle. And keep the heights and width the same as you can. And then once I had the first row of these, I drew a second row. And then I thought, you know, let's, let's talk about scaling and fractals. When you do texture and form to draw things, uh, big can be an object or a form, and small can become a texture, and fractal math has taught us that everything is often ultimately fractal in nature, and you can exploit that a lot. Try this. Try inventing a few of your own. Work on high contrast geometric patterns and creating mosaics in even larger pages if you like, but start small. Start exploring them in these small cells, okay? Do a whole page of different patterns. Exploring forms that have the illusion of depth and lighting. This is, we're going to get much more into this as we go, but here's a quick introduction. Uh, what I've done here is penciled myself some very quick geometric shapes. To do more, our circle, remember in gesture drawing, move freely, get it going evenly. Before you put on the page, start light and build up. And then once you have, don't keep going too long. And once you have the basics, stop. And then you can do a little bit of editing. This does not have to be perfect, so don't spend too long on it. Here's our circle. Now to ink this, I could try going on one stroke. It could be very badass. Use the calligraphy, the Japanese calligraphy stroke. But I don't do that that often unless I'm just quickly free drawing a circle. When I'm doing something like this, I usually break it up into arcs that are very comfortable. I'm using my wrist and a little bit of enhancement with the hand. I try to keep the movement minimal so that it's smooth. And I start and I move away from myself and I only go about an inch or two per stroke. And because I'm building it up, you know, with the brush, there's often a little bit of feathering, but I'm trying to maintain a, a consistent, even line. So I'm focusing on things like the limiting and controlling that motion, but also my depth to maintain line weight. And remember to exploit being able to turn the paper. Keep the surface oriented. And towards the point at which I'm pivoting from, the T. And don't worry about mistakes. Ultimately, if I make a little blob or lob that I want to fix, I'm going to leave it for now. We can come back to edit that. Continue methodically making the kind of line you are while well, you're in that mode of motion and function. Coming back to it later and making exactly the matching kind of mode to finish this, the drawing is harder. At this point, if I want to, I can go back and correct with whiteout. But for this exercise, again, 
don't worry about perfection. Don't do a lot of correcting. Show me what you got done the first time. Uh, it's better for a class anyway. Now, this is we have a circle. To make this a sphere and suggest lighting, you find your equator and try to draw roughly the middle. You can always check your measurement by use your pencil, the tip, mark through the thumb, line up. Are we that close? Look, it's pretty close. For this project, that is good enough. Now we did a tried to do a round circle. We're going to now do ellipse based on the equator. An even ellipse. It looks like a cat's eye. That will now look like a line that traces a spherical surface around both sides. So I've drawn in, this is your light source, and your ellipse. And we call this line the equator or terminus. And it is it's the equator around the sphere. It's around the middle of the sphere. Or the terminus is the point at which the light no longer can reach it and it starts to become dark and shadow. Because this light source is somewhat in front and it's it's hitting the sphere here. That first part's too low. A Forty-five degree angle from that will be the point of the terminus. So if that's the hot spot, the terminus is going to be there. The halfway point, which light can no longer reach the object. Make sense? So light's traveling this way. So we're going to do feathering lines, starting from the inside of the sphere, the, the circle line, and ending at the terminus. Thick to thin, thick to thin, thick to thin. The smoother they are, the smoother and regu more regular the surface they suggest will be, or will appear to be. It's an optical illusion, but it's very effective. Now, you could leave it like that, or you could do some cross-hatching. Maybe think about making these lines follow the suggestion of the curve of the sphere to help enhance the feeling that it's spherical. And think about rotating the page. The orientation doesn't have to shift for every stroke of your hand, just the paper does. There you go. Now, Second shape to try, it's your three-sided triangle. And I overlapped them because I wanted to play with the lighting too. So we're gonna make this one larger than the circle oh, and behind it, okay? This doesn't have to be a perfect triangle, but you wanna do try to do a triangle pyramid shape where each side is roughly the same as the other. Remember your consistent depth, feather a bit of the points because that'll make making the point easier. Feathering in down to consistent depth. Line stops where it goes behind the object because you want them to be one behind the other. This is a continuous line. Remember to measure that you're oriented right so that you don't find that you're like this. You want to measure that you're oriented right. Remember your T. Measure. Stroke. And again, remember you're oriented right. Remember your T. Measure. And stroke. Now, again, our light size is here. This object is a little bit more behind and towards the rear of the light source. So this would have been where, if the light source was directly beside the pyramid, the terminus would fall. But this one is way around front which means, when you think about it, hitting a circle, that's why we see a sliver of moon, or a not quite full moon, depending on where the sun is. This is a round surface too, so it's a cone. That's our guideline for our canvas. Small, short feathering lines, they'll grow in length as we come down the length 
of her cone. The third form is going to be basically two squares with crossing transverse lines. Orient your T two parallel lines. Connect them with a the transverse stroke. So the walls of your cube with an open two open sides or one open side perhaps, we're going to do a little bit of shading based on our light source. So follow the transverse, stroke pretty much the whole distance between, but go thick to thin, thick to thin. Why would we do that? Well, remember, things closer to us are more well lit, things further away are less. It's not actually a factual truth, depends on your light source, but as far as the eye is concerned, as an optical illusion, it's a very effective way to suggest depth. Now, there's some different ways to do the cross hatching here. You could just go again with just that, like I did. I left this on the uh, on the cone. But if you cross hatch thin to thick vertical lines that follow this line of the wall, you will sell a very even, and I find often sort of like hard lead surface. And it's okay to go back and think, okay, this needs to be thicker. And if you can, try to do the strokes in this wall all in one stroke. Again, I've, I was feathering it, doing them in batches. If you want even a more smooth or more machine-like surface, try to do it a continuous stroke. We'll get more into this in class, but we're now combining texture, rendering forms, and thinking about depth and geometric space. This is going to get a lot more complicated as we progress, but this is your basic exercise. Build some basic geometric forms and then light them uh, and exploit your practiced textures and surfaces and patterns. Make the walls of them a mosaic pattern, perhaps, to help work on how you do the geometry of orienting that pattern there. It's not as hard as you think. I'll talk to you about it in class. Use something like the basket weave on your cone and see if you can orient it along the surface to suggest that your cone is actually a weaved material. Um, do pebbles or bricks on your ball so that it looks like a brick ball or one that's uh, really a pile of little stones. Good luck and enjoy your inking exercises.